Good morning and welcome along. Paper Talk is on now and we're going to be discussing the fallout from Manchester United's draw with Leeds last night as well as a story that might get Newcastle United fans very excited indeed. And so to discuss those topics, delighted to say we're joined by uh, Flex, of course, from the United View, big Manchester United fan, and Luke Edwards, who covers the North East for the Telegraph and lots, lots more, of course. Uh, Flex, Luke, great to see you both. Morning. Morning. Good morning to you guys. And uh, we're going to start with last night's game as Manchester United came back from 2-0 down to draw 2-2 against Leeds. Uh, we're going to start with the Sun, gents, if that's all right. They've got this headline, nice one, San, which is uh, taking on, obviously, Jaden Sancho coming off the bench to score uh, that equaliser. Flex, I will start with you. Uh, you must have been delighted from a Manchester United perspective to see uh, Sancho get a goal, but uh, it wasn't all plain sailing last night, was it? Absolutely wasn't. It was it was sort of a, a bittersweet um, situation last night with Manchester United. It was actually a no manager bounce for for Leeds. You know they've got a, a few caretaker managers in there, and they they startled Manchester United. I think that at the beginning of the first half, not being sharp, not being ready for the game, and being one nil down, that really affected us. And then it was pretty much all Manchester United up until the half, looking for that equaliser with chances from Ganacho and chances from Spitzer and Manchester United just probing. Eric Tenor probably would have got his players in at half time and said, you know what, guys, keep going, keep pushing. That goal will come, but don't make mistakes like you did at the beginning of the first half. Come out for the second half with fair play to Leeds. They started well, created a crossing opportunity, and we're 2 0 down. So um, it, was, it was a really difficult position for Manchester United to be in. Um, but you know, to get to James Sancho, he really was a shining light last night. And in a game where it was two points dropped by Manchester United, and a great point, you know, from Lee's perspective, it was fantastic to see James Sancho back out there. The, the, the support that he's had from the fans um, in his cameo appearance uh, against Nottingham Forest. Uh, OK, it was a bit difficult circumstances um, against Palace. Um, but for him to come back in and to, you know, have that long road to recovery just proves how how much he missed it and you know his social media post last night just absolutely epitomized that and he looked sharp he looked bright gets himself a goal could have got himself a couple of assists as well um and it was just great to see him back out there a true testament to what can happen if you, you know knuckle down buckle down take yourself away listen to the manager um and reform yourself and that's what it really looked like and, and it's another um sort of uh, tick in Ten Hag's box in terms of how he's dealing with with tough situations at Manchester United. Yeah, another tick in Ten Hag's box. But Luke, I mean, other other top four rivals would have been rubbing their hands together as Leeds flew into that two goal lead. But uh, did did it show, uh, you know, the 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 togetherness and the in the spirit of that Manchester United team to to come back and, and and snatch a point and almost win it actually in the end. Yeah, I think you're right, Pete. I know, I know pretty much who you're talking about for the top four rivals. Before they're rubbing their hands with Lee because it was a, it was a good result for Newcastle uh, and it was a good result for Tottenham Hotspur. But yeah, I think Manchester United lose that game, don't they? Last year, maybe even the season before, uh, going 2-0 down at home to, to Leeds. Um, a, a very impressive mental response. And I think that's a phrase that I'd like to use about Jaden Sancho as well. I'm, I'm really, really pleased for him. Um, we sometimes have a lack of empathy uh, as football supporters of, of, of rival clubs, even sometimes in the media. Um, he's had his problems. He's had his mental battles. I think Ten Hag has uh, alluded to that. He needed a break from football um, to get his head right, to get his body right, to get his focus back uh, on what it meant to be a Manchester United player. A really, still a very young, really exciting player. And for him to come back and, and, and snatch that, that, that draw for Manchester United uh, when they're in a bit of trouble, that, that's a really great moment for him. And I hope, I hope this is now, you know, the point he turns the corner where he gets his, he, not, not just his career back on track because that's secondary, but get his life back on track as a, as a young man and let, let's see him fulfill his potential because he, he, he was, not so long ago, one of our most exciting talents. And I'd like to see that come back. And I'm sure Manchester United supporters would like to see that come back. Before we get on to takeover talk with Manchester United, guys, just a quick one on Leeds as well. Flex uh, performance last night that showed a lot of those players uh, post Jesse Marsh looked like they'd almost had the, the sort of pressure lifted off the shoulders a little bit, certainly in the first half and, well, the first hour, really. Yeah, and for me going into that game when we were sort of doing previews, that was a sort of banana skin that you, you kind of you posed as a Manchester United fan. And actually, Eric Ten Hag spoke about that within his press conference before the game. He said, you know, we're not really sure how Leeds are going to play, but we need to be 
um, ready for it. Um, and I think Leeds, I think they played with the reins off. I think they played with a little less pressure. Um, I actually spoke to a few Leeds fans after the game who actually said they, they saw this game as damage limitation. They see this game as, or they saw that game as, as almost like a, a free hit, a chance to play without any pressure and just go and see what they can do. And like I said, you have to give testament to Leeds. We've spoken about Manchester United and how well we did to show mental strength. Well, for Leeds, it was a little bit different in terms of, I think they did in moments, you know, make Manchester United feel uncomfortable. They did that in the first couple of minutes of the first half and got a reward for it. And they forced the issue in the first five five minutes of the second half uh, to force another mistake and, and, and subsequently a goal from Rafael Varane from an own goal. So it is a difficult, it's a weird situation for them because when the new manager comes in, which I'm sure we may talk about in, in, this, in, in this short segment here, um, that's when the real work starts. But at the moment, you can play with, with, like I said, the reins off. You can you can have a fresh outlook on things and kind of go for it because I don't think many expected any any points to be uh, going Leeds' way. Um, and that's not being disrespectful. That's just me going on the, on, the, on the air of where they are on the table and what's been going on and the chaos that's been going on. But I think yesterday was a good reflection that actually um, when you play with, with less pressure and you have a bit of a free hit, uh, you can get a positive result. And now that game at Ellen Road... Uh, with Manchester United's problems in midfield, which we did kind of see with no Eriksen, no Caras Casemiro, big misses. Leeds fans are completely optimistic now, thinking, you know, they can they can beat Manchester United at Ellen Road. And Manchester United need to be ready for that. Yeah, indeed. Uh, very quickly, Luke, any ideas on the, the next Leeds manager? We expect an announcement fairly soon. They're, they're talking about the Raya Vallecano boss, aren't they? Androni Irola, do you think that'll be the man? I think that's looking the most likely, but... From what I can hear, I don't think Leeds quite know who their new manager is going to be yet. So it's kind of difficult for we in the media to know as well. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I would expect they I was told they wanted to make an announcement for the weekend. So obviously we're getting pretty close to the weekend. So we just have to wait and see. But I would say he's in pole position yet. On to the next paper, shall we? Uh, we're going to look at the mirror now. And this is Glazers in... Uh, Six billion dash to cash in. It's all about the, the ownership of Manchester United, potential Qatari takeover. What are the Manchester United fans feeling about this one, Flex? I, I can't speak for the, the whole fan base, but in my opinion, what I've seen and what I've heard and, and obviously some of my thoughts is I think there is there is excitement in, at the at the fact that the club is for sale and at the club and at the fact that the Glazers will be selling the football club. There was, you know, a lot of excitement when Sir Jim Radcliffe um, put his name into the hat and Ineos came out and said that they were, you know, wanted to be potential buyers and wanted to make a bid and have entered the process. We knew that that would spark um, others into action. And that seems to be, um, you know, the, the sort of um, royal family from Qatar. Um, it obviously is going to have polarising opinions in terms of, you know, a state a state-run football club that comes with a whole host of opinions and a whole host of whether that should or shouldn't be. I think we have obviously seen it happen in the Premier League with Manchester City, with Newcastle United now. So it has been happening in the Premier League. And I think once it has been happening, that's why the door is open for it to continue to happen. So I think there, there, there are many opinions across the board. You know, if you even go back to the World Cup, which I, I spent time out there for the whole the whole time, and we saw the sort of polarising, uh, you know, conversations that happened around that, around whether it should have been there, whether it shouldn't have been. Obviously, the actual football and the World Cup side of it was absolutely fantastic. I can definitely vouch for that. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be sort of, Remaining open-minded on this, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm here saying that every Manchester United fan should endorse a takeover from that part of the world, and and no, you shouldn't. I think it's for people to make their minds up, do that, do, do their uh, due diligence um, on this, and come to their own conclusion. But essentially, I think what the buzz about Manchester United is is that it is not going to be the Glazers, and that the Glazers are going to leave the football club. Whether that means for owners who are who are going to treat Manchester United with better care. Uh, better attention um, and in a different way. We're hearing a lot in the media about uh, the intentions of, uh, of of whether this it would be from Qatar. We're hearing a lot about redeveloping the stadium, redeveloping um, the, the training ground, the area around Manchester United and um, that area in particular of Manchester. So those are all buzzwords that Manchester United fans want to hear. Um, but like I said, I, 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 I would I would struggle to say that everybody is on board with that type of ownership. Well, Luke, I'll come in to you because you covered the Newcastle United takeover so closely as well. A lot of similarities here, isn't there? I mean, do, do you think it'll get the same scrutiny that the, the Newcastle takeover got from the, from the wider world of sport? 
Um, I suspect not, because I think, I think those um, those barriers have been broken down, haven't they? Those objections were, were, were largely ignored for the Newcastle United takeover. Um, I think we, we have to adopt a wait and see. I think Flex is right. Um, I, I don't think it's by any means a foregone conclusion that that the club is going to be bought by the Qataris or, 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 or the sovereign wealth of, of another Middle Eastern or wherever it may be country. Um, so Jim Radcliffe is still very much in there from Ineos. I think he would be probably the, the, the first choice of most supporters, like Flex. I can't speak for, for every supporter, but he's a Manchester United supporter growing up, um, a British-based businessman. Um, and, and I think, you know, that they wouldn't have those, sort, those same moral issues that are there. That word sports washing will come up. We heard it from the World Cup. There will be some who have grave concerns about this because of Qatar's human rights records, just as there were, there were people who had grave concerns about Saudi Arabia's public investment fund buying Newcastle United. But I have to be consistent on this. Yes, I have moral scruples about all of those things and who those owners are and, and what they do in their own countries. But it goes back to this, and I said this about Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Pete, if you remember. If, if the British government uh, deals with these countries on a diplomatic and economic on a military level in, in the case of Saudi Arabia, then it's not really football's place or football supporters' place to object to these countries, these nation states buying their football clubs. So I do think that has been my, my stance on, on, on Saudi Arabia taking over at Newcastle. I think it would be my stance exactly the same if Qatar in some way, shape or form were to buy Manchester United. So that we should never lose sight of what these projects are about, but for the everyday supporter going to their, their, their watch their team play, the team they love and always have done, I, I don't think we, we should expect them to be the moral bastions of, of, of British society, quite frankly. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you have the last word on this one, mate, because uh, Flex talked about Manchester United redeveloping stadiums and, and so on. Uh, Newcastle, a lot of talk now up in the northeast that the stadium could be expanded. A story here from our friend Craig Hope in the Daily Mail saying that uh, the land's been bought back, that the stadium's going to be made bigger. Uh, what are you hearing? Um, yeah, well, I, I think the story is absolutely 100% correct. What they're going to do with it is, is what we really need to to know now, um, the moment it's going to be a fan zone, um, which I, I'm slightly underwhelmed by, if I'm perfectly honest. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of fan zones, but that might be throwing my age. Um, but what it does open up, Pete, as you're, you're well aware, is that if Newcastle are going to expand the Gallagher End, um, which is a major feat of engineering, by the way, because there's a, there's a metro station underneath, which are equivalent to the London Underground. It would need huge foundational support. I think even... Believe it or not, the, the Mike Ashley regime looked at, at least looked at it, doing it, never got anywhere near doing it, of course, because they, they didn't have that ambition. But it's a huge feat of engineering. But I think it could potentially add between eight and 12,000 seats into the stadium. And, and crucially, and I think this is really, really important for, for Newcastle United supporters, they don't want to relocate, but they do want a bigger stadium. This buying this land is probably the first step towards being able to both increase the capacity but crucially stay in the heart of the city at that iconic sort of situation on, on, the, on the hill overlooking the city. So I think that's what Newcastle United supporters want. And I think it's probably down to the owners have listened. And that's one thing they have done. They came into the football club listening and, and, and deciding that was the best way to go. But in the short term, I'm afraid it's just a condo. So we'll have to wait to see whether that stadium is going to come and when.